This file shows examples of how to do simulations with Stata. The point is not to show how you can simulate datasets or how you can analyze datasets, but rather look at the mechanics of different kinds of simulations. For that reason, I'm only using a simple regression analysis as my population model. So I'm generating X and Y and analyzing those data with a simple regression. That analysis itself is not particularly useful, but these same principles that I explain on this video can also be used to study more complex models and populations. The first example is a single sample simulation. A single sample simulation is useful for a couple of purposes. First, you can use single sample simulations to test if statistical techniques work in some scenarios. And uh, the idea here is that if you generate data from a very large, uh, in a very, generate a very large sample from a known population, if you have an estimator or a statistical technique that is consistent, then it will produce the correct population result from the sample. So this can be used to verify consistency of estimators. It is also a useful technique for producing examples for yourself, for students, for assignments, for teaching. You can show how things work and try different things out in a very specific set of conditions that you control for yourself and in large samples. Let's take a look at how the code works. So I first start by clearing the data and then I set the seed. And setting the seed relates to how computers produce random numbers. In practice, computers don't produce random numbers, but something that we call pseudo random numbers. So pseudo random numbers are a deterministic sequence that looks like as if it's random. Setting the seed determines how that sequence is formed. When we set the seed to one, we generate some random numbers. If we reset the seed to one again, then it will produce the exact same set of random numbers. This is useful for a few reasons. Most importantly, it's reproducibility. If I have a uh, an analysis example that I sent to a colleague, then I want that colleague to get the same results from the analysis as I do. It would be very inefficient to argue about a methodological problem, for example, if my example fails to converge when my colleague runs it. It's also useful for teaching. When you develop examples for students or assignments, then uh, if you set the seed number, then the student, if they do the assignment correctly, the students will get the exact same results as your model answer has. So it just guarantees reproducibility. The next thing that we do is that we generate the data. We set the observations to 100. Then we generate X and we generate Y. So, so let's run it. So we run the first. Then we set observations. We generate X, random normal data. We generate Y, random normal data. And now we can list. We can see that our data are there. We have 100 observations, random normal, center at zero, uh, X, has a variance of one and y has a variance of two because it's x plus random normal. We can of course generate more complex models, but here I'm just interested in doing this simple example. Then we run regression analysis. We can see that the coefficient that we get is close to one and one is the population value because we don't multiply x with anything here. So regression analysis works pretty well. If we run this code again, then uh, we'll get the same result because we set the seed. If we don't set the seed, but we, we clear, and then we run without setting the seed, now we get a different result. So the coefficient was is now 107, but with the seed set, it was 1002. So this is the example of reproducibility. No matter how many times we run it, then uh, it produces the same result. We can also, of course, modify the equation. For example, if we want to get, generate a regression coefficient of two, we would multiply x by two. We run the thing again, and we can see that the regression coefficient now estimated from the data is again close. The R square is 80, so that is unreasonably high. If we want to generate R squares that are more representative of research practice, we can, for example, multiply the error term by five, and that will produce us 
a regression uh, with R square of, of about 0 .0 0.05. So that's a lot more representative. So we can play around with the population model and see how the regression results behave. So that is the single sample simulation. The next example is simple Monte Carlo simulation. So this extends the single sample simulation by running the data generation and analysis multiple different times. This kind of analysis are useful for checking how statistics behave in populations. For example, we could check how regression analysis, how the precision of the regression analysis estimates is affected by sample size. We could also check if an estimation technique suffers from small sample bias. The multiple different samples are required because in small samples, if you just generate one sample, then that, that estimate from that one sample could be off by chance only. If we do, let's say, 100 or 1,000 replicated samples from the same population, then any of those random errors will cancel out. Let's run the code to see what it does. And then, uh, then I'll explain the result. So what this code did is that it generated 1,000 samples from a known model with a regression coefficient of 1. And uh, we have the mean regression coefficient is almost 1. So it's very close to 1. It's unbiased. Standard deviation is 0 0.1. So that tells us about the uh, variance of the estimate. And this is the, the density plot of the estimates. So on average, estimates are 1. But there are some estimates that are between 0.8 and 1.2, for example. So there's, uh, there are some that are minus 20 or plus 20 percent too large. So there is some estimation error here in individual samples, but on average they're correct. We could, for example, modify this code to see how regression analysis behaves in larger samples. So for example, if we set the, uh, set the sample size to 1000, we run it again, we can verify that regression analysis gets better as sample size increases. And this is something that you might do, for example, in the power analysis. Now we can see that the standard deviation of the estimates was 0.1. Now it's 0.03. And most of the estimates are between 0.95 and 1.05 instead of 0.80 and 1.2. So regression analysis gets better as sample size increases. Let's return to the code where it was. Now, let's see what the code does. What we need for a simulation, like a Monte Carlo simulation in Stata, are two things. We need to have a program that defines a set of commands that are run as a sequence. And this is our program. We call it sim. We could call it whatever. Then we have the simulate command that we can use to run multiple replications of our simulation. This capture program sim is required because redefining a program causes an error. So if we have tried to rerun this, then uh, we have an error program sim already defined. So we need to do program drop sim. This capture here is required because if we try to drop a program that doesn't exist, it causes an error. So, um, well, now it runs the full, full, full um, code, but if we just try to run it, like so, there's an error. So the capture prevents any error from uh, stopping the execution. So we this basically drops any option, any program called sim if it exists. If the program doesn't exist, it doesn't do anything. Then the, uh, the program here starts with program. We clear the data. So this is exactly the same thing as we do in a single sample simulation. It's just encapsulated in the program. What the program does by default is that it returns whatever this final command returns. And uh, you, can, you can change that. There are commands, for example, return command. You can return other things. So you could, for example, calculate two regression models, calculate the difference between the estimate and return that. But when we test the statistic, then this is the simplest way. Just generate data and then uh, you run regress. Another way of of comparing two different simulate estimators 
would be to just um, generate the same data sets twice and then uh, have one program generate data from one estimator, another program for another estimator, and run those with the same seed. One important thing to note is that the seed must be set outside the program. So it will be uh, kind of logical to define the seed here, because this is where you start generating random numbers. But this is an, a big error that sometimes I see beginners do, and it's an error because it guarantees that every run of the simulation uses the same data set. So when we run the simulation here and um, we summarize the result, we can see that there is no variation. So if we list the data, we can see that every regression coefficient has the same value. That is because we generated each random sample using the same seed which, which means that instead of generating a thousand independent samples, we generated the same sample a thousand times. <clears throat> when we look at the simulation command, this has uh, four, three parts. First is uh, whatever we collect, we just collect underscore B, which refers to the estimates. And then we have options. We simply uh, have options that we run a thousand times. There are other options, for example, you could save the simulation results into a file, but we just leave them in memory. And then we have colon, and then we have whatever where is the name of our simulation program. So this is the simple Monte Carlo simulation. The next example is a simple Monte Carlo using parallel processing. The idea of parallel processing is that normal modern computers have multiple processor cores. For example, my M1 MacBook Pro has 10 processor cores. When you run an analysis, then normally it runs on a single core, but you want to be separating the work across multiple cores, and that speeds up computation. Stata has support for multiple multi-core processing, processing built in, but how it works is that it works on a single command level. For example, regression command gets a small speed boost from parallel processing, and the number of processors that are used depends on your Stata license. I think my Stata license allows the use of two cores out of the 10 that my computer has. In simulations, when we run replications of a code, running each replication on a separate core is a lot more efficient than trying to parallelize one regression model within, an estimate, within a replication. So how this code works, this just runs the same thing a lot quicker and uh, we can run it and show there. So it's a lot quicker than uh, running on a single core or without parallel processing. There's like almost the order of magnitude difference in speed. And uh, we need to have a, a user written package here because data does not support parallel processing except what is built in into the commands out of the box. You can install the parallel from by using these, these lines here. So you need to install some Mata libraries as well. And you run these codes and you can read about the parallel library here. There's a journal paper and then there's a tutorial online how you apply. The parallel basically requires two things over the simple Monte Carlo. One is that you need to run parallel initialize, and that sets the number of computer cores that the, com the simulation can use. It sets it to 75% what is available on a computer. And for my computer, we could set it to 10, but 75 is okay for this purpose. Then uh, the sim command works a bit differently. So instead of using simulate, we have parallel sim. Then instead of having beta, we have this option here, so option expression. What are what is that we capture? We capture beta from the results, and other than that, it's uh, uses it's uh, specified the exact same way as the built-in simulate command. So moving from simulate to parallel simulate requires simply changing your simulate command a bit, installing this stuff here, and then running parallel initialize. There is really no reason not to use this when you do simulation work, except 
then when you're developing your simulation code, you might run into errors and it's a lot easier to troubleshoot something when it's running on a single core instead of on a multi-core. But this package here, which now runs on, on seven cores, has this nice feature that allows us to uh, print the, uh, the error logs from each of these child processes. So this is a very user-friendly way of, of doing parallel programming. The next example is multiple Monte Carlo simulation using nested loops. Uh, what nested loops means that we have these, these four loops that are within each other. This kind of simulations would be useful for methodological research. And when you want to study how an estimation technique works under different conditions. So the conditions that we have here is that we vary the sample size and then we vary what is the regression coefficient in the population. We need to adjust the simple Monte Carlo with a couple of things to do this kind of multi-factor Monte Carlo or a multiple Monte Carlo. What we need to do is to have a way of giving the sample size and the beta or B regression coefficient information to the program. We do that by using the syntax command. So what the syntax command does it is, is, is that allows you to pass different arguments to programs. The easiest way to use it is to have a comma and specify whatever you need as options. You could have var, var, var list and if and in and whatever you can have in a stata command. But this is the easiest way. So we specify that we have a an, an argument called n, it must be lowercase because um, uppercase refers to abbreviation and the name of the macro that this produces is always lowercase. So we use integer, which means that this is a whole number. So n is integer, that's the sample size. And then b is real, which means that it's a decimal number. Or it can be a whole number as well, but these are different ways of storing numbers on a computer. So b and n are here and then they are available as macros. So this back tick n, normal tick, is uh, the macro that scores the option n, and then b beta here, back tick b, up normal tick, is what stores the regression coefficient. So instead of having a fixed number here like before, we have the macro n, and when Stata runs this file, before running this file, it writes in the content of the macro, which will contain the sample size, and then runs the program runs the command. The same here, it writes whatever is the value of beta, that macro, before it, or it evaluates what is the value of beta, b here, and then it runs that with the value of b substituted in the command. And then uh, the estimation works the same. <clears throat> the simulation needs to also have a few things that we didn't have before. So we have the um, the loop here, so we loop macro called n receives values 100, 200, and 500, and macro b receives values of 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. So this goes through all n and all b, and it goes through every b for every n. Then in the simulation, we will do a couple of things differently. So instead of capturing b, we are now capturing with names. So uh, we are storing macro n into n. So we want to store the sample size information. We could also have the sample size information from the file name that we are saving. But uh, it's I think I find it useful to just store it directly into the data set. Then we store the value of b. And then we store uh, the regression coefficient of x under the estimate. And uh, another thing that we need here is, is saving to a file because simulate always leaves the results, the simulation results into your memory. So if you if you run simulate many, many times, then whatever we have in the memory of the computer is going to be the results of the final simulate. So we need to save the file result of each simulate into a file. And we're just going to save in the working directory. But then we have n and b in the file name just to, to distinguish them. And then in the sim, we have the options n and b. When we run this, it, <clears throat> yeah, let, let's run it. And it'll run for a while because it runs nine different simulations of 1000 replications each. And <clears throat> then we will have 
the files in, in my downloads, which is my working directory now. And uh, then the next thing that we need to do is to, uh, to load the files by append and uh, then we summarize them. So this uh, uses the macro function dir, which gives us the content of the directory. So we are taking the content of the working directory. We are taking files that match simulation.dta pattern. And then uh, we append all those data into our, our memory. So um, we can run that file, come on here. And then we do macro macro list. Let's, let's copy rather than run from the file. So we can see the result files here now contain the, the, file, the names of these files. And uh, you can you do help macro. That will show you how it's done. So we're using the macro dir function here. And uh, then we append all those files. So we append all those files and then we can summarize the results. Yeah. The macro is always, it has a scope. So whenever I define a macro and I run a do file, then that macro is not available in the do file. And if I define the macro in the do file, it's only available in the do file. So I have to define it in the same file where I use it. So we can, we can do tabulate. That gives us a quick and dirty cross tabulation. We are tabulating the mean and standard deviation. So regression analysis, we can see here that it is uh, unbiased regardless of sample size. We get the correct result, always the correct result. And uh, the standard deviation of the estimates does not depend on the regression coefficient, but it depends on the sample size so that the estimates become more precise when sample size increases. So this is a quick and dirty table. Uh, if you want to publish your results, then you can use the customizable tables. You can do the same thing, and then you can customize the layout of and presentation of this table for your publication. So this is an example of a multiple Monte Carlo using nested loops. This is uh, a useful way of getting started using multiple Monte Carlos, but there are a couple of uh, downsides. First, you have this uh, managing of these files, which is a bit inconvenient. It will be much more convenient to have the, uh, the computer just store the files somewhere or store them in, and the results in the memory and just have them there without having to uh, specify files yourself. The second thing that this is not easy to run on parallel computing, we could do parallel computing on each simulate, but it's typically more efficient to run the conditions on parallel and then run uh, every replication of a condition in a core and then split the conditions, the simulation conditions or designs over different cores. And um, another downside is that when you have many different factors, design factors, for example, we would have a number of, we could have a number of predictors, we could have correlation between predictors, and we could have, for example, error variance to have uh, three more factors. Then we have uh, five nested loops, and the code becomes a bit difficult to read. Finally, this only allows you to do full factorial. So for example, if we would uh, want to run certain sample sizes or certain conditions only when sample size is large enough, we can really do that easily, or it would be very confusing to write ifs and if statements here. So there are other ways of organizing the simulation that we can take a look at next. The final example is a multiple Monte Carlo simulation using design matrix and parallel processing. So um, the code is here and let's, let's zoom into the specific parts and take a look at what it does. So this will run substantially faster than the previous. So we can run it and it takes a little while because it's running still a thousand replications for each core, but it should be done. Yeah, so here we have. So it's about maybe close to 10 times faster than without parallel processing. So how do we do this kind of parallel processing? Again, we need to have the parallel package and um, the setting the, uh, or the simulation program is the same. Now we need to have uh, another helper program. I'll explain the role of the helper program in, in a while. And then we have a design matrix. So the design matrix here is um, a data set. 
that describes the simulations that we run. If we uh, run the code and then we do list, we can see that this uh, code shows that all possible combinations of N and B that define our simulation setup. So we have nine different designs in the simulation formed with uh, combinations of three levels of N, uh, N and B. How the simulation works is that we iterate over this data set and then uh, we, we run the simulation using this design, then we have the simulation over using this design. So we, we iterate over the rows of the data set and each row defines a simulation design. What the code does is that we just generate some data and uh, or enter some data. So we enter the data with N and B. We could enter more. So if we want to have a sample size of 1000, we could go to the data editor and uh, we could add 1000 here. It doesn't make a difference that there are differing number of observations. And then uh, the fill in creates all possible combinations. So when we run that, we would have then a uh, combination except we need to drop the missing data. Okay, we, we drop the ones with missing beta and uh, then we run do the design matrix. So you input whatever are unique values of N and B or whatever your factors, you do fill in to get create full factorial or possible combinations and then you add a design number to identify the designs. And then uh, that is our data. The next thing that we do is uh, <laughs> we initialize parallel processing like before. And then we have this file here. So this is uh, instead of using the parallel sim, we use the parallel command and parallel breaks the data into chunks. So if we have four cores, then it breaks the data into four subsamples and it runs the analysis that we specify on each subsample. So when we run parallel here, this uh, breaks the data into seven chunks. So we would have, or seven subsamples, we might have one, two, to be one subsample, three, four to be another subsample, then four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine to be the rest of the subsamples. These are the observation numbers. And uh, we tell the parallel that we need to ha have the program sim and the program run sim that I'll explain in a, in a minute to be available for this worker. So uh, the program simply says that these programs need to be uh, also given to the worker threads. So the worker processes. Then, uh, because this splits the data into uh, seven, or in my case, into seven different subsets, we still need to have a, a way to iterate over each of those subsets. So we don't want to run simulation for a subsample of one and two, uh, observations one and two, but what we need to do is to run the, the simulation on one line at a time. And we do that by using the run by command. So the run by command is basically, um, it's a user written command that works the same way as, a, as the by prefix, except that it works also for commands that don't, that are not viable, so that they don't support the by prefix. So this, this splits the data into uh, the course, let's say in the seven subsamples. And this further splits each subsample into individual lines because we are splitting by design. So this parallel program here might say that, okay, this observations one and two, they go to the first core. And then this run by says that these uh, observations one and two are further gonna be split into two different chunks based on the design matrix. Then we have the run sim and the, what the run sim command does is that it takes the first observation from the data. In this case, the only observation, it takes the value of N from that observation, the value of B from that observation and uh, stores those as variables. And then uh, it, it gives 
the or passes the n and v as arguments or options to the sim command. So to recap, what it does is that parallel program parallel splits the data into subsamples, run by splits each subsample by design, and then run sim takes uh, the first observation, which in this case is the only observation, and runs the simulation using uh, the content of that observation. All these commands, what they do then is that they will uh, just uh, append the results into one big matrix. So if we can see or one big data set, we can see here that, well, if we run this again, it gives us the, the data set, the simulated data set. So here we go, that's the simulated data set. So what is the advantage of this approach? Well, the advantage is that it splits the designing the simulation, so design matrix from the actual simulation code. So you can do more complicated uh, designs like fractional factorial. There is um, a bit less simulation code instead of loops. We have this one and that one, and um, it can parallel. Uh, it can do parallel programming. 